Syria, we're honored to have uh, amongst us Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick, who will be addressing a critical issue for our community. He'll be speaking about from survival to reviving, and he'll be talking about 10 steps for reviving our community. We live in a time in which we really need to return to the basics of our being. And as they mentioned today uh, in, our, in his khutbah, uh, to be a people of principle. Because this is what our faith and our being is, is founded upon. It is all about being people of also being people of firm foundation, being a people of, of principle. So he'll be addressing this issue and inviting us today. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction about to Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick. He was uh, born and raised in the United States, in Boston, Massachusetts. He became Muslim in the early 70s. And, and then he uh, continued his, his studies. Uh, he earned a bachelor's in Islamic studies from the University of Medina. And he earned his master's and PhD in history from the University of Toronto uh, with his PhD thesis dissertation being on one of the uh, foremost West African scholars, uh, Sheikh Rajman uh, Denfulia, uh, who was a, a scholar and a mujahid uh, in, uh, in West Africa. And he uh, has, over the past four decades, uh, been to over 61 countries, lecturing to tens of thousands of people uh, of all different backgrounds, ages, Muslim, non-Muslim, and in all various forms. So whether it's in conferences or lectures or uh, as a TV presenter, uh, mashallah, he, uh, he has much experience in, in this regard. Uh, he currently, he's actually served as an imam in Jamaica, uh, in Toronto, in the United States, as well as in Cape Town, South Africa, where he was uh, for a number of years before he returned finally to Canada in 2010. Uh, and now he is currently at the Institute, Islamic Institute of Toronto as a scholar's residence and a senior, a senior lecturer there. And so it is an honor to have Sheikh Amallah uh, Hakim quick uh, amongst us tonight. Uh, and so he will uh, enlighten us with his words and we'll have uh, some time at the end uh, for a question and answer to the next All praise are due to Allah, Lord of the world, and peace and blessings be constantly showered upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad, the Master, the first and last, and his family, his companions, and all those who follow to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. My beloved brothers and sisters, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa Alhamdulillah, it is a great opportunity uh, to be here with you uh, in London. And this is one of the uh, oldest places where Muslims lived uh, in Canada. But alhamdulillah, you are blessed with a lot of young people uh, coming into Islam. And I wanted to speak to you tonight um, not as an Islamic scholar and not as an intellectual and not from the mind but from the heart. And I wanted to speak to you in a way that is practical and to share with you some of the thoughts um, and some of the experiences that I've had over the years in traveling throughout the Muslim world and seeing the condition of Muslims. And especially here in North America, where our situation has become also very critical. So I want to share with you uh, some of these points and leave the floor open uh, for a discussion. The Muslims today are in a very unique position. If you look at the Ummah, our nation, that stretches all over the planet, we make up over 26% of the Earth's population. Our countries live in strategic areas. If you were to look at the mineral wealth on the planet, you will see that over 50% of the mineral wealth lies under our countries. 
Whenever you look at a situation uh, happening in the Muslim world, you need to not just look on the surface, but you need to go under the surface. And then you will see what the real issue is. I remember some years ago, there was a, a great struggle in the Sahara Desert. You may have heard of um, the Tawadaks, the people men where they cover their faces. And um, there was a struggle in the, the, the desert, the Sahara, the Kubra, in the country of Mali. And so the French forces were dispatched there. The French came in in order to put down the so-called uh, insurgency uh, that was happening there, started amongst the Tawadaks and then became a full-blown uh, insurgency. And their understanding was, their reason was, they were trying to bring stability to the region and also help the Malian government. But the reality is, under the sand of the Sahara Desert lies one of the largest uranium deposits in the world. And the French nuclear um, program is almost completely supported by uranium that comes directly out of the Sahara Desert. So the real reason why the French were there was not had nothing to do with the Tawarik, because they had been living live in the Sahara for hundreds of years. It was the uranium that was under the ground. And you can literally go to all of the situations of Muslims, and you will see in the background there is some uh, economic reason, uh, some riches that this Ummah actually has. We also have some of the richest people on earth. You know they give you a list of the top 10 rich, rich people on earth. And they tell you uh, Carlos Slimi in Mexico and Bill Gates. And they tell you about our leaders, some of our leaders, uh, they don't have bank accounts. Because their bank account is, is, the, is the national gross national product. They control all the money in the country. So you can't know how much they have because they don't have a bank account. So we are not a poor nation. We are actually an extremely rich uh, nation. We also have young people. They did a study of the Muslim world and they found that in most of the countries, 60% of the Muslims, 60% uh, uh, of people uh, 25 and under uh, you know, 60% of the Muslims are, are 25 and under. 60%. And when they looked at Europe, at France and, and the countries of Europe, and this is shocking information, because you hear about Europe and the French and they won't let the women wear uh, the, the veil to, uh, you know, to teach and, you know, government and whatever, a terrible situation. In Paris and Marseille, 45% of people 25 and under are Muslims. 45% of Paris and Marseille in Belgium and Holland right now, 50% of the children born in the hospitals are Muslims. One out of every two child born in the hospital. And it's all over Europe that it's happening like this. So we are a nation of the future. We are a nation of the future. We are a young nation, where many of the Western nations now are actually what they call graying nations, right? Most of the people are 50 or over, right? So one group is leaving and another group is coming in. Along with this, we also have um, the sources of Islam. We have the original Quran. We have the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu codified in authentic form. So if we want to go back to our original teachings, we can do it. And many other nations cannot do something like this. We have huge standing armies. Hundreds and thousands of men standing in arms. And what I found, and this is what I want to share with you, I found a serious contradiction. Because with the great wealth, there is also great poverty. And one year I went, I was in the Sahara Desert region in a place called Timbuktu, which is actually a center of learning. 
and I went from there to the Emirates. And it's like two different planets. And it's the same Ummah, the same Shahada, the same Salat. Uh, yet, this is a contradiction. With great wealth is part. With the great armies that we have, we are feeling a serious frustration. It's a serious frustration. And so, um, this contradiction is really the essence of the issue. That there's something wrong that is happening. And when I search the sources, you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, made very clear in a number of different places. And in one case, Allah, Allah Azza wa is telling us, um, in Surah Al-Hashar, Ya yuhaldina amun taqullah wa tamu nafsun, that Allah said, O you who believe, have the consciousness of Allah, and that every soul look to what it put forward for tomorrow, and fear Allah. Surely Allah is well aware of all that you do. Be not as those who forgot Allah, and so he will make you forget yourself. Surely they are the disobedient ones. So this state of nisyan, of forgetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the wealth that we have, we will not come to the poor. The armies will not come to liberate, you know, the areas that needed to be liberated, liberated, and to help the innocent people. They will suppress the populations. And so this is a condition, and this has happened many other times, in Islamic history. This is not the first time. And one of the blessings of our nation is that we have tajdeed, and that is, that is the revival of Islam, al-ihya al-Islam, that Islam is, has been revived. Even though we went to a very low point, we're able to come back up. That is the beauty of this nation. And one of the scholars, uh, came to us, we, I was living in Cape Town at that time, in South Africa, and one of the scholars came, and, they, and, and they, the people said, how is the Muslim world? And he said, the Muslim world uh, is, is fine. And people said, how can you going to say this? But he said, if you look at our nation, look at what happened after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu even during his time in stopped, and after his time, a rib died, they apostate. A large group left the religion and they had to struggle to keep them in. Then there was even a fitna that went on among some of the companions. And then following this, there were waves of attack on the Muslim world. The Crusaders came. The Crusaders came with their armies into the Muslim world. But we jumped back. The Mongols came. And when Genghis Khan's forces it hit the Muslim world, and the writers are writing about Ibn al Athiyya is writing about it. And this is the 13th century, the Mongol destruction of Baghdad. He said, I wish my mother never gave birth to me. So I would not have to be the person to write about what I'm seeing here. Okay? They thought it was Yom al -Qiyam. They thought that the Mongols, Yahjuj or Mahjuj. They thought it was Gog and Magog. Right? But after this, we came back. And there was a high point in Islamic uh, 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 studies and you know after the Mamluk defeated the Mongols, Sayyidatin puts us running Allah, and they defeated the Mongols, then there was a resurgence of Islamic knowledge. Right? It came back. Then the colonial period came. And our countries were enslaved, colonized, languages taken away. But then there was a resurgence national identities. And so now the Muslim world is rising, but we are in a state of confusion. You know, it's almost like when you're just getting up out of your bed, and you're walking, and then you're a little bit hazy. And it's not until you drink some water and turn on the lights, then you, then you realize, you know, that's how we are. We're like hazy, moving around, waking up. It's like a giant that is waking up. But there are certain issues, there are certain things that we have to do. 
And these are not strange things. If you study the history of Islam, you will see the rise of civilization and the fall of civilization. And it is clear in our teachings what we have to do. What I want to look at tonight is not the Muslim world itself, because that is an entity that even I do not fully understand what is going on. And honestly, when some of these things are happening, and I'm being straightforward with you, when some of these things are going on in the Muslim world, like these bombings and things, I don't even think it's Muslims who are doing it. I think it's somebody else who's actually doing it. And Allah knows best. But it's a confusion. And with the, the, the internet and the cyberspace, it adds to the confusion. What I want to look at is here in the West. What can we do as Muslims? What can we do? And this is important. Because when you study the history of Islam in Canada, you will see that Muslims came to this part of the world over a hundred years ago. When Canada was opening up, when did the, these, when did these early colonies of Upper and Lower Canada, they were given a, a discount by Hudson Bay, not the Hudson Bay department store. It was the Hudson Bay Company that controlled much of, of the center of Canada. They gave them a bargain discount. I don't know if it was Black Friday or not. But they gave them a discount and they sold them the middle of the country. And they needed people to come in to open up. So they brought in people from parts of Europe. And because they had a connection with the Ottoman Empire, they also brought in people who could meet their color standards. They had a racist standard. They did not want people uh, uh, who are brown, yellow, black, no. They only wanted light-skinned people to come because they have a racist system. And so from the Ottoman Empire, they allowed to come in people who came from Turkey, Albania, Bulgaria, Syria, Lebanon, and came into this part of the world. Many are Muslims. And they settled here. They settled in the West. And they lived. But what we recognize is that uh, they lived and sometimes set up masjids and centers, but after a period of time, they melted down into the society until you can't even know who they are. So there are some people walking around right here in London who might have a Christian name, but if you check his grandfather, he was named Abdurrahman. But now this person, is a Christian who had no religion, and they're lost in society, melted down. So the point is, what can we do to revive Islam? In the early 70s, 60s and 70s here, we did not have a large community like this. There was only a few Muslims around. In Toronto, and we have the largest population in the whole of Canada, we only had two masjids to pray in the 1970s. Two. Okay, and on, on Eid day, in, in one of these masjids, it wasn't even as many people as this. Imagine this, it's Toronto, right? Where now you have in the GTA over 10% of the population are Muslims. And so, an expansion of the numbers. An expansion, and so, uh, but the question is, what do we need to do? Because in those days, we were just surviving. If you could make five salat, this was a mirror. If you could pray Jum'ah, if you eat halal food, that was an amazing thing to do. So it was a period you could call of survival. But now, it's not just survival, it is revival. That we have to now revive Islam into our community. There has to be a way for us to do this. And I want to bring you a few points uh, ten points in this area, which over travel, from traveling for years in different communities, I've seen these points happening over and over again. These are some practical issues to talk about. And I'm going to be very straightforward with you uh, with these points. Okay? So point number one uh, of the ten points of, of from survival to revival, and that is the other to talk about. And that is an increase in the consciousness of Allah. Because really, 
the basis of what we do is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the relationship is weak, your salat is going to be weak, your fasting is going to be weak, everything is going to be weak. So that taqwa needs to be uh, revived. And that is why uh, the Imams, you will see, uh, mention taqwa. And some schools of thought require that the, 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 the khatib must mention taqwa. That's how important it is. How do you increase your taqwa? One of the ways that the scholars tell us is that we try to be as pious and as good in secret than we are in the open. Look at your salat. How is your prayer when you pray here in the masjid and everybody's looking at you? Right? And then when you pray by yourself in your house. How do you pray? If your prayer can be equal or better when you're by yourself, then now your taqwa is increasing. Why? Because when you're by yourself, nobody's looking at you, right? It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you can develop that consciousness, that feeling of, of, of the creator of the heavens and the earth, right? He will, to, to that, come inside you, it will like energize you. Try to be around people who remind you of Islam. You know, sometimes you see the brother coming walking along and Zayd is walking in. And when you see Zayd, you say, it's a type of salat. Because you saw Zayd. So some people remind you, try to be around people like this. Will remind you of your deen. Okay, instead of the opposite. And when you're by yourself, do good deeds. Give sadaqah. <laughs> Give charity when nobody else can see you. Right? If you do this, now you are defeating your nafs, the amal of the suit, the bad side. Because you're doing things for Allah. And that's the biggest struggle that Muslims have today. That's what I believe. It's not these political things. It's not these economic things. It's in here. It's in our hearts, right? There's something inside of us that's got to change and it's directly connected with the consciousness of Allah. And so, to try to increase this always, think about it. Some people say, you get an Iman boost. Right? Get an Iman boost. Right? Go to a place where the Muslims are gathering. We find that even if, if you do things, uh, you're giving out things in charity, call to the good, forbid evil, this will increase your Iman. So try to do Hasanat uh, to increase that Iman. Point number two. A return to authentic sources. That we need the basis of our deen has got to be authentic sources. What is Islam versus culture? Your culture is where you come from, the type of food you eat, the clothes you wear, your language. Right? And, and, and for most Muslims, much of your culture is Islamic. But there's a part of your culture that's not Islamic. And some people, when they practice their deen, they do it, they say, well, uh, when, when I get married, uh, this is what my father used to do. Or this is what the people in my village used to do. Instead of looking at the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and going back to the usul, right, the base points in our faith. This is a crucial issue. When I first came into the deen, and then I used to eat halal food, every time I ate halal food, uh, it was hot, it had chilies in it. So I thought halal food was hot food. Because so, every time, you know, there's chili in the food. Then I met some people, uh, you know, uh, Bosnian people and other people, you know, they don't like chilies like this. The chili is your culture. The heat in your food, the real, your deen is how you sacrifice the animal. Right? What makes it halal. You see the difference in the two? So we may, we may have 20 different ways to prepare chicken. That's our culture. Right? But is it a halal chicken or not? It's not whether it has curry in it or, or, or pepper. Right? It is how you sacrifice the animal. See the difference in the two? The same rule applies to marriage and divorce. Relationship of parents to children. The community to the imams. Right? So many things, how we run our business. Do you run your business like your father used to do? 
Or do you run the business according to the rules of Islam? So we turn to the authentic sources and all of us, you know, especially non-Arabic speaking people, we need to study classical Arabic language in order to go into the sources and if you get a chance to get a good teacher who can teach you the usul, that the fundamentals of your deen, the fiqh of the deen, so you can think, you can think in a way of, an Islamic way of thinking. Right, so this is how we, we need to return to these sources. Right, and this is an issue in all of our communities. Because if, if my Islam is based on my culture, I have something different, I'm not the same as you. But if it's based on the deen, right, that we have something which is, unites us, all of us. And we can find unity in each other, and we can actually appreciate differences. Because the essence of our deen is not my culture. If it's your culture, this is what happened in Toronto. We had two masjids. And then the city expanded. I left and went away. When I came back, there's masjids all over the place. And you go into one masjid, and it seems like you enter and it smells and you look like Karachi, Pakistan. And you go to another masjid, and you're like you're in Mogadishu, Somalia. And you go to another one, you're in Istanbul, Turkey. Right? You're entering into a nation when you enter them. And that's good. But if you feel strange in that mosque, something's wrong. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You see? So returning to the sources and de-emphasizing culture. Number three. And that is to focus on character. Focus on character. For a long time, we taught our children in madrasa ibadat. So you teach uh, tahara, uh, wudu, salat, and these are the fundamentals. We have to teach these. But now we need more than just teaching the fit of it, not just how to pray. Why do you pray? Why do you pray? Do you, does anybody know why you pray? One brother came to me, he was really angry, and he said, I said, what was wrong? He said, I told my son to make salah, and he said to me, why? Why? And why was not in his father's vocabulary. There's no why. But he should know why. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, inna salata, tanha al fahshari wa mudka. Prayer will prohibit you from evil and, 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 and corruption. There's a reason why we're making salat. So we need to teach this now. The character of Islam. The Prophet said in many traditions, and in one he said, Ibn Watar Imam Malik, he said, Bu istimli yutam mima husn al Verily, I have been sent to complete the best in character. That's the essence of being Muslim. It's not your clothes, it's not your language, it's character. The world is looking at us. How are we going to respond to things? This is how Islam spread. It's character. This is the crucial thing. People thought that the most important thing is you have, you have your aqidah, or you have your clothes, or you travel with the jamaat so many times, you do this. But what's your character? If you have good aqidah and terrible character, then what's the purpose of your aqidah? If you say you know the fit, and then you insult other people, and you're tribalistic and racist, then what is the purpose? of the fiqh, you see? So the character is your expression of the knowledge that you have. And this is crucial for Muslims today, to, to show the younger generation. It's not just memorizing a lot of things. Act like a Muslim. <laughs> That's really going to make the difference in your life. Learn how, to, how Muslims deal with each other, how we deal with other people. Get the character of the Prophet ﷺ. Study the seerah his life in order to get his character. Many people look at the battles and they look at the political things, but now it is really the essence of his message was how he dealt with his family, how he dealt with business, society, right? In all circumstances, this is the crucial point. Number four, wisdom and balance. We have to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for hikmah. For wisdom. And the Arabs would say, what was shaking the 
Putting things in the proper place. Wisdom. This is crucial now. It's not the amount of Quran, the amount of Hadith. How do you use it? You know, it's like a doctor. If you go to the doctor and the doctor just looks at you and he looks at your eyes and says, what's wrong with you? He said, and then he said, okay, take this pill and yell the next. No, that doctor didn't deal with you. The doctor's supposed to examine you. Right? Your temperature. Look at your hands, your pulse. Learn your history. The doctor examines you properly. Right? Then he has wisdom. He has hikmah now about you. And he can prescribe the proper medicine. This is what's happening. We're taking in Islamic knowledge and no wisdom. And it comes out extremism. So we have one extreme or another extreme. What we need is the balance. It's the balance. So one of the key points in the revival of Islam is to gain this wisdom. To have this, what some call wasatiya. It's like a moderate, balanced approach to Islam. Right? You don't go to one extreme or another extreme. Right? You're balanced with the Sunnah as the basis for your balance. This is a crucial part that we, we need right now. Because we have a lot of extremes in our communities. And we in Toronto, we have a huge community. So we get a lot of these extremes. Really strange things. Some things that might not even hit you. Here, are hitting us here in the extreme. Point number five for the revival and maintenance of Islam. Healthy, empowered families. Healthy, empowered families. And this for people in the Muslim world has been one of the strong points. Even though the politics might have gone bad, we had our families. But now, the families are breaking down. Divorce is rampant in our community. It is a reality. And the families need to be healthy and empowered. And that means that the women of Islam need to be empowered with knowledge. They need to study the same Tawheed or Fiqh or whatever the men study, women need to study. We need to produce women scholars. And in our own families, empower the family. Give everybody a chance to talk. If you're going to move your house to another place, Give everybody a chance to talk in the family. Right? So empower a healthy family. We have to eat healthy food. Halal food is good. It's necessary. But remember the Quran talks about Kulu uh, Eat what is in the earth which is halal, permissible, and it is it is good, healthy, wholesome food. When I was living in South Africa also, they did a study and they found out that Muslims were dying from heart attacks. <laughs> More than anybody else. And we said, this is a strange thing. We're eating halal food. Man. We don't eat pork. How can Muslims be dying like this? And then we looked at the, the food of, of, of certain groups and some people, they cook their food in this heavy grease, right? And so the food is really greasy and spicy. And after they eat that, then they give them the drink, they say, Coca-Cola Classic. So if you eat a greasy meal and you put Coca-Cola on it, it's like making cement, right? And it's cementing the arteries going to your heart. And literally people were dropping dead. And they were not overweight. But it's because the food that they ate was not healthy food. We have to stop thinking about that. You have to stop thinking about organic food. This might sound strange, right? But you've got to stop thinking about organic food. In our, in our chicken, in our, many of our food, there's steroids in it. There's chemicals in our food. So, halal tayyiba. Right? So our families have to learn this. Balanced diet. Balanced living. Right? How to survive in a simple way. Healthy, empowered families. Number six of the ten points 
from survival to revival, and that is sure consultation. This is a crucial factor, I believe, in the future of Islam. And it goes on all levels. One of the problems we have in our families is that husband and wife, they don't talk to each other. If there's a problem in the family, especially the men, we don't like to talk. Right? But somebody has to intervene. And sometimes if you just talk out the situation, if you take consultation, you can solve the problem without going into a divorce. Mutual consultation. Talk to each other. The Prophet you know, would talk to his wives. He would allow them, he'd be criticized by people. He allowed this. And he's receiving revelation from above seven heavens. Consultation in our communities. It's important to have town hall meetings to discuss the future. Consultation in our community. Generally, and, and, and alhamdulillah, there is unity here in London. But in Toronto, we are in need of a, a medalist ashura, where all the masjids need to send leadership to this medalist There needs to be shura amongst the masjids. This mutual consultation is really crucial. And this is what swept the Muslim world. Especially you saw a few years back, they said the Arab Spring. It actually turned out to be a disaster. But what was one thing what they were saying when they were marching in the street? Ashab yurim is al nidam. You remember that, right? The people want the system to come down. Why? Because the leaders don't listen. They don't take sugar with anybody. They just do what they want to do, right? So this is not, we're not dealing on that level of political level. Even in our houses, in our homes, shura is crucial. The next point, point number seven, is cooperation and unity. Cooperation and unity. That we have to be able to unite with each other. This is what I call operational unity. What is operational unity? That is that amongst the Muslims, there are different schools of thought. There are different types of Islamic movements. Right? And I'm going to be, I may be naive, but I'm sorry. All of these movements, all of these names, Salafi, Sufi, Ikhwani, Hizbul Tahriri, you know, Jamaat Tabli, whatever it is, if it is not reuniting Muslims, throw it out the window. Because that was not used in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi We were Muslimun, Mu'minun, Muhsinun. And these movements only came all around to deal with issues at a certain point in time. And sometimes in a particular part of the Muslim world, we have to start to break down differences between us and learn operational unity. Sometimes the difference between you and another Muslim is only 5%. 95% is the same. We fast the same, pray the same, uh, eat halal food the same. But if you look at the 5%, right, that becomes a big thing. 95, we have to start looking at the 95% and agree to disagree. And if somebody is doing something wrong, make dua for them. That's the way of the ulama. Pray for that person, instead of scandalizing that person or attacking that person. Look at the companions of the Prophet It is reported that uh, uh, the great uh, leader, Khalid ibn al-Walid, the sword of Allah, tall warrior, but he didn't know much uh, Quran. He, he memorized Quran late. So he didn't memorize them. So it would come time to make Salat. They would not look for Khalid to be leading Salat. They look and they see Abdullah ibn Mas'ud Atin Yemeni Right? But he is master of the Quran. So Abdul Ibn Mas'ud leads Salat. Right? And Khalid, the warrior, is in back of him. That man is his leader. When he says Allahu Akbar, he moves. When he says Sami Allahu Akbar, Hamida, he moves. So he accepted that man, although he was not as big and strong like him, but he accepted him because he was suitable for the leading of the Salat. You see? It's suitability. It's merit, meritocracy. Because the person is suitable. So you take the good part of that person, 
and you help them in the other part. And the same group, whenever the enemies of Allah came amongst the companions in those days, everybody look and say, where is Khalid? Put him in the front. The enemies are here. Khalid's in the front. What did Khalid do? Did he make a new group, his Khalid? Did he make a Madhab Khalid, Tariqa Khalidiyah? No, he was just one of the Muslims. That's all. His ability is in the same stuff as the other people. So we have jamaats and groups who do different things. MashaAllah. Now is the time for us to have operational unity. Right? That we can sit together and learn to appreciate each other. This is crucial now because the enemies of Allah are even playing upon our differences to turn one side against the other side. See? Operational unity. This is a crucial point to take us from survival to revival. Point number eight. A special emphasis on youth, on the young people. Special emphasis. Because these young people, they have a way of looking at the world that we don't have. This cyberspace, this internet thing, they have a whole different way of looking at the world. When I teach some of my students, I say, I was born in BC. You know, BC is like the caveman, no, before computers. And that's not a long time ago, right? It's only in the 90s, right, when the computers came. That's how fast things have changed. Or I would say, I was born in BFB before Facebook. You see? But the people who were born in this age have another understanding. So, the Prophet used to take the youth, sit them next to them, next to him. They were involved in leadership discussions. Not the youth group and they do everything by themselves over there. No. If you're making a decision, the men, the leaders of Islam, right? Talk, you know, bring some of the youth in. Ask them what they think. And you'll be surprised what they say. So emphasize the younger generation. Empower the younger generation. Empower them. And then when it's time for leadership to come, they naturally can fit into the leadership. Instead of having to bring somebody from overseas, they naturally fit in because they were, they were guided into the leadership, you see? If you look at the great leaders of Islam, Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, Rahimahullah, he didn't become Sultan Salah al-Din out of nothing. If you study his life, you study Nur al-Din Zengi, and Imam al-Din Zengi, Rahimahullah, and you see how they raised him. He came from the tradition of people who were struggling against the Crusades, right? And he fit naturally into it, and he became the Sultan. If you look at the great leader of the Ottoman Turks, Muhammad al-Fatih, uh, you see the great uh, who opened up Constantinople. His teacher would say to him and his father, you will one day open up Constantinople. That's what you're going to do. So he grew up like this and he was empowered to do it. So he was trained in skills. He had religious uh, studies. He also knew mathematics. He knew engineering. Right? You do administration, all these different skills. So our younger generation, they have to be empowered. Man. Skills development training. Empower the younger generation. Have leadership camps. Leadership training camp. This is where the leaders will come. They're not going to fly down on a white horse in the window. That's not how it goes, right? It, it's, it's, it's a development that happens. So emphasize the you. Point number nine. Empowerment of new Muslims. Empowerment of new Muslims. Alhamdulillah, you have now active people who are involved in this. Uh, this is crucial that every masjid community has a way to reach out to society. If people are interested in Islam, then a way for them to make transition into the Muslim community. This is the lifeblood of Islam. That's why Islam spread to different parts of the world. Because other people came into Islam. And they were able to learn Islam. Right? And they added their strength to the Ummah. So a special emphasis on this. 
right, for new Muslims to make the transition into the community. And point number 10, which is a crucial part to go from surviving to reviving, and that is a dawah to Allah. Outreach. Outreach. Feeling out to society. That is why the, the a program is so important. That's why I came here for this program tomorrow. Outreach. Come out of our shell. And when we do this, it actually invigorates you. It gives you energy. When you're calling somebody to Islam, you start thinking, okay, am I doing this myself? So it'll actually revive Islam within yourself. And Dawah today is not standing on a street corner uh, with a book and then, you know, debating with people. There may be some Muslims who do that. But the best form of Dawah we have found in the field is providing Islamic solutions to real problems. And you do it for a while. Look at our community. We have a lot of things to offer to society. This is Friday night. And we can enjoy ourselves, we can relax, we can smile, and we didn't drink anything. We didn't smoke anything, right? And you can smile. We didn't have a drink, I believe, right? in society. They can't enjoy themselves unless they take a drink. They have to have drugs in their body. And it's destroying them. As I mentioned today in the Juma, this opioid crisis, it is one of the biggest killers of people in our society today. It's a silent killer. Drugs, drug dependency. So we are a drug-free, alcohol-free society. Okay, if we're practicing our deen, it's a way to come out of this. This is a, a major thing to do. I'll show you an example. There was an enlightened Libyan ambassador who was living in um, Guyana, which is in South America. And uh, he, Jazawallah Khair or Rahimahullah, he, he took the Libyan funds and he put it into the path of Allah. So they wanted to study what was happening with people in this section of Georgetown, Guyana. And they found out that the people in this area did not have doctors. They didn't have a lot of doctors. So he bought some land and he bought, and they put a, had a three-story building on there. So they got doctors and they had free medical clinic for the people of the area. And so the people would come in and they would get their, uh, you know, their, their appointments and get their medicine. And then inevitably somebody would say, uh, why did you do this? Why are you giving it? And the brother would say, I'm a Muslim. That's all. No argument, anything, I'm helping you because I'm a Muslim. Inevitably, somebody would say, what is a Muslim? And they say, go to the second floor. On the second floor is dawah material, books to read, coffee and tea, at your, you know, so they would go in there and read about Islam. Inevitably, somebody would say, um, can I become a Muslim? They say, go to the third floor. On the third floor are the brothers and sisters of dawah who can take you to transition into Islam. And in this way, hundreds of people became Muslim. No debate, no argumentation. It is servicing humanity, right? And you're doing it for Allah. That is one of our, that can be one of our greatest uh, our blessings today. Allah blessed this community with wealth. We have wealth. Allah blessed us. What are you using it for? If you give back to society and you do it for Allah, you may not know it but you're doing one of the best forms of da'wah that we have. Just make sure you do it. We're not showing off, but we're Muslims. And this is what we do. And so, this is a crucial thing for us. You know, and these points were tilka ashalatul kamila. There's a ten points of the many issues that we can focus on, you know, to, it's like a homework. How can we revive ourselves? How can we now move on? And when we're trying to deal with society, you want to go down to the shelters, you're, 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 you're caring about poor people and you know what's happening in the society. And, you know, they, this is strange. Some people look at you like you're strange. You go to the bank and they say, Mr. Abdul, uh, here's some interest. Take interest. And you say, no, I don't want to. They say, you're strange. 
some accounts and the people are taking off their clothes and we're putting them on. They said, you people are strange. Friday night comes and people are drinking, right? And we're not going to drink and smoke. They said, you're really strange. It's Christmas season, right? You know Santa Claus, right? You've got to take a drink. Right? This is what they're saying. You're strange people, but I give you glad tidings that the Prophet Sallallahu has told us, إِنَّ الْإِسْلَامَ بَدَعَ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا فَتُوبَ عَلَى الْخُرَعَ He said Islam began strange and it returned to being strange. So glad tidings to the strangers. And they asked the Messenger of Allah, who are the Qurawa? And he told them, الَّذِينَ يُسْلِهُونَ عِنْدَ فَسَادِنَا They are the people who repair. They repair themselves and society when the people have become corrupted. And Sadaqah Rasulullah this time has come to pass. And so I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would help us to, to, to revive our Islam and to survive this fitting that we are going through in this critical time. And I pray that Allah would especially bless the younger generation and protect them and give them strong iman to withstand uh, this terrible struggle we are going through Keep quick. We'll open up the floor uh, for questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions uh, regarding uh, the, the lecture or what uh, Shaykh Abdullah had to say, uh, then uh, please uh, ask your questions. Uh, and we also have a microphone uh, for the sisters. Our floor is open. Maybe they can hear you for any questions, any immediate questions anybody has before we break up. I will leave the 10 point manifesto uh, with the chef. If anybody wants these points, I'll leave it here with Chef Abdul Fattah. So if anybody wants the 10 point manifesto, I'll leave it here with Chef Abdul Fattah. 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 I'll leave it sharing of this very important message. Um, I was wondering why you did share uh, specifically the importance of empowering women with knowledge, whether you could comment also on empowering women in our communities to step forward into positions of leadership and influence within the Muslim community and also outside of the Muslim community, because I believe we are still dealing with certain mindsets around why women should not be in leadership positions, whether that's because of cultural reasons, like you mentioned, or even of the beliefs of women themselves that they cannot or should not be in these positions of leadership. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Khan. that this is a very important point. And that is part of the empowerment. You know, and if you go back to the original seal, look at the life of the Prophet, so you will see women were empowered from the beginning. Khadija Radiallahu the first person to accept Islam. She consolidated the Prophet when he was in you know, shaking. Sumeya, right? Radiallahu the first Shaheed. Aisha, you know this, right? So they were empowered in the first generation. So this is part of our team. And that's why I say separate culture from Islam. Because some of our cultures got corrupted in the colonial period. And honestly, people ask me why where does attitude come with men, you know, with women? And, and I try to figure this thing out. And maybe it is during the colonial period, the colonial powers took away the power of the men. They say, you no longer have any power, you're nothing. So maybe they got frustrated and they take it out on their own. So they, they fight inside their own house and he's the sultan of his house. Because he can't be sultan outside. Right? Something must have happened. Because Islam is supposed to empower women. And, 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 and the position of women, and the, the you know, position of Um Salama radiallahu anha, many of the Sahabiyat, they were advisors to the chief companions. They were even judges, making judgments in the community. Not locked away somewhere. And this is the reality of what is happening now in many of our communities. Uh, for some you know, sociological reason, whatever it is, the Muslim sisters, when it comes to teaching, I teach at Al-Mahanim Institute, 
and um, the Muslim sisters are our best students. Everywhere it's happening. And so, you know, we have to benefit from this. This is not something negative. That's good. If the men are going to stand forward, somebody's got to go forward. And this should, in, in, you know, this should empower the men also to go forward. So yes, this is part of the empowerment uh, of the Muslim families and the Muslim women as well. Uh, it is an excellent point. Now, yes, sir. You mentioned that, that we know that there is a pillar of difference in the Islamic Ummah at the moment, everywhere, not only Canada. And then we know that uh, every the pillar is ulema or uh, leaders. Can you repeat your question, please? Well, my question is that uh, we know that there is a pillar of difference in the Islamic Ummah in, in, in Canada or everywhere in the world right. today. And uh, the, uh, it is increasing, and the difference of, uh, of the Ummah is increasing. Therefore, the, the Ummah is a part of the, of the difference. Is there any way, or is there any uh, way that they can come together, Ummah, so that if the, if the, if the Ummah uh, agree or come together and talk, can the conclusion then uh, the people, but the public, will be okay. Well, you know, you know, if you look at the Muslim world, the masses of the Muslims don't really have this problem. The masses of the Muslims, they want to just be Muslim. And in, your, in the leadership, right, our leadership has been under attack for a long time. And, and it is systematic attack. And in many of the Muslim countries, I found out, especially say 40, 50 years ago, or even 30 years ago, if the family had a bright son, then they would say he's going to be a doctor. He's going to be a doctor. Otherwise, he's Mohandas, he's an engineer. Or he's an accountant. Right? But if, if he's a little if free and he makes problems, you have to put him in the madrasa and make him a chair. Right? So now, you expect now for somebody to come out of the madrasas, you know, that have been under attack, right, and not getting the best quality, you expect them to lead the nation, it's not going to go like this. This is why we're in a change now. We're appreciating, you know, the importance of, you know, the study of our deen. And it's now spreading around and not dividing secular, you know, from sacred knowledge. And what is happening is that enemies of Islam actually empower one group against another. This is something, if you read, there's a thing, and this is public, it's called the RAND Report. It was something put up by the RAND Corporation, right? It's some years ago. Go back and read the RAND Report, right? Then you'll see what's happening right now. This is not by chance, okay? But, alhamdulillah, movements are happening now. We have the Canadian Council of Imams, you know, where we are coming together now, and you know, we're going to come to the public more, and we're bringing imams of different groups. Check uh, Abdul Fattah and I, check Jamal, you know, other people, different groups. We're sitting together. In Toronto. You know, we go to different places. But this is a council that, that includes Ontario and even people from other parts of Canada. It's spreading. And we will bring in different schools of thought, different movements, right, into the council. We even have some of the Shia. We have certain principles that we live by, but we have to learn to agree to disagree on certain points. Because these divisions are being played against us. And we have to overcome this. Because the Muslim world has got a lot of dif we have differences, but we can solve our differences. We've always had some differences, but there's a way that we can resolve it. And so this is a process that the ulama are going through now. It's going to take some time. Because you have, unfortunately, what they call the ulama sultan, right? You have some scholars who are being paid to cause confusion. And these, some of these extreme jamaats, if you look, they are actually sponsored by other people to cause confusion. So this is, we're dealing with all this confusion. But, you know, this is the message that we're bringing up. It's a, it's a message of a type of wasatiyah, 
right where we have a, a moderate middle road balanced position. It's based on scholarship, but it is a balanced position. And if it gets on the ground, the people also have to begin to demand this from the leaders. They have to demand it. If people demand it from the leaders, many of the leaders, they will change because they want to be a leader, right? And if the people don't want uh, a leader who puts them in a little corner and says everybody else is kufar, we're the only people going to paradise. If people don't want this, then he, he won't have any followers. But if we want somebody like this, then you'll always get somebody coming along, you know, who will bring the divisions. So it's a process we're going through, and inshallah we have to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know that, you know, it's because, you know, we're in a crisis now, man. Serious crisis. And I say to some brothers, you know, a person came to me and said, Brother Abdullah, can a, uh, can a Hanafi marry a Shafi? I said, wait a minute. Can a Hanafi marry a Shafi? Are we Jehovah's Witnesses and Catholics? Like, what is this thing? The Imams were teachers and students of each other. Why, how do you make divisions like this in yourself? Right, so, but our, our conditions are getting so difficult, we're being forced together, whether we like it or not. And if we don't do it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has proven in history, it will happen to us. Tabhis, we will be purified until we wake up and come away from these small divisions right, and, 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 and unite ourselves. But it starts with the individual, with all of us. You can't put it just on so-called scholars. It's everybody. We have to come out of our tribalism, our nationalism, out of our ways of division, and look to the Muslims as one Ummah, the people of the Qibla, people of the Qibla, right? Different ways of praying, fine, right? We're all after Sunnah wa Jama'ah. This is how we, we need to now. So I will open up the floor for any final questions that anybody has. Uh, yes. Yeah, very good question now, my young brother. I see how the young brothers asked the question. He said, how long have you been researching this? And where did you get it from? This is not, I didn't get all this from a book. Right, one of the best ways you can learn is travel in the path of Allah. If you travel to different countries and you, you're doing Islamic actions amongst Muslims, you're gonna see, start seeing things. And so I started seeing things, you know, and realized there's, there's something happening here. That we need to revive Islam. So this came from a long time uh, of traveling. You know, I went to Saudi to Medina to study in Alhamdulillah in 1973. 1973. That's a long time from now. It's a long time. I was in Medina, right, studying. So from then, you know, studying and traveling and seeing the Muslims, you know, and trying to you know give some kind of a contribution. Uh, you know, Allah. Yeah, the other final question, yes, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, there are some communities uh, in Canada who are becoming uh, politically active and they have also captured uh, key positions in the parliament right. where we are Muslims are lacking far behind. Uh, as an uh, Imam's <coughs> council, are you going to address that and get our people organized? Because that's where decisions are made. Which country to bomb, which country to all these decisions are made there and that's where we have to be there for us to influence the government in the positive direction. What kind of action? Yes, in, in the Imams Council we are, we are definitely looking in this area in terms of empowerment in dealing with the government. And uh, for a long time we stayed in a little shell. We have to come out of this shell, right? Because we have an influence. How, you know, in Toronto we're 10%, I think you're 10% of London too, right? You're 10% of the population. You have more political power than what you realize. Okay, so and it's not political power just to say, my party and to win and jump up and down. No. This is the quality of your life. It's going to impact, you know, the area you live in, uh, the rules about building codes and all kinds of things. It comes with your relationship to society. So if there is um, value in it, being involved with some of these parties, 
Then, you know, the position taken by, you know, uh, the majority of the scholars is it is permissible, uh, even though there may be some aspects of these groups that we don't agree with. But the overall good of it, you know, is more than the evil that is in it. We don't identify with the evil, that we relate to the good part, and it is, it is something which is directly affecting us. Right, so in this case, uh, it is permissible uh, to be involved. And it's not just to join the party, to jump around with the colors of the party. No, but it is to get some strategic advantages, you know, for the Muslim community. And also to help the, the indigenous people, the poor people, that's part of our mission, right? Al-Amru bin Ma'ruf wa Nahi al that's part of our mission. Right, so, so we need to come out of ourselves uh, and be part of the society. Alhamdulillah, you have begun this process uh, here. Inshallah, may Allah make it easy for you uh, in this process of you know, coming out to society uh, you know, with uh, the outreach. Uh, now, the other final questions uh, that we have? Alhamdulillah. So uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accept you know, um, uh, our deeds and any mistakes here that I have made, that is for me. And I ask the Lord to forgive me. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Nashadu wa la ilaha ila anta. The stuff for the two of our leg. Bismillah wa rahmatullahi wa rahim wa ras. Inna al insan wa rahim khus. Inna al adhina amadu wa amadu salihah. Wa tawasul wa rahim wa tawasul wa salam. Wa sallallahu ta'ala sayyidu wa muhammad. Wa alihi wa sahbihi wa ba'ali wa salam. Subhanallah wa rahim 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 wa